This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks again to Cal. Thanks, Carl. 30 of these uh, webinars is more than one person should have to take uh, with me, Carl. So hopefully, <laughs> appreciate you uh, hanging in there. Cal, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll try to set the stage a little bit for where we are right now and then uh, talk about some of your mowing work. And also, I pulled out uh, one of your old uh, per, uh, uh, large consumer trials that you did looking at IPM and organics and stuff like that. So we'll get to that uh, in our 30 minutes. That's going to go by pretty quick. Uh, a student, when, when they were laying by Stewart Park, uh, laying in Stewart Park by the lake, took this picture of uh, one of our favorite plants, right, in the turf world. Uh, and just uh, always nice to get a nice picture, particularly how beautiful the sunsets have been uh, lately around the lakes. Oops, here we go. Remember how to do this. All right, so in fact, we've started to catch up. Just in the last uh, several days, we're starting to see that we're getting closer to normal. And you know, what's really interesting is if you look north, if you look up here uh, in the most northern parts uh, of, of, um, of the Northeast, you see that they're in fact uh, a little bit ahead. And you see uh, down here in the Maryland area, Cal's old stomping grounds, our, our friends in New Jersey, our friends on Long Island, you know, it's been really cool and, and it remains uh, behind normal. Now that's not stopping the grass from growing uh, in response to the heat uh, and humidity that we've been getting. Now, Cal knows I still rely as a measure uh, of good weed control in the spring, uh, the, the uh, model developed using 2,4-D on dandelion at Purdue many, many years ago. Um, I really like it just as a ballpark. Uh, some people uh, have not found it to be useful. We found it to be a good place of thinking about when's a good time to make an application. So that's a good indication that the growing season is advancing. This went from uh, completely red a week ago to completely green in almost a week. So obviously being able to get out there and know these conditions is gonna be important. It's starting to get dry. Uh, the marine layer uh, over the coastal areas of the Northeast have sort of prevented some ET, but once it burns off, uh, you can see that we're pretty much, particularly in, the nor in, in Northern New York, for those of us, you know, up here, uh, we're starting to fall behind uh, in, in rainfall uh, and, and ET, ET is reaching its peak conditions. And you can see now throughout much of the North here, right, much of this North, we're in excess of an inch to an inch and a quarter. You know, you're talking about losing a significant amount of water from your turf system every day. And if your lawns are on sandy soils, uh, they're going to need some kind of supplemental irrigation to, to meet their requirements to maintain active growth. Now, you may not want to maintain active growth, and that's a different question. Now, the heat stress is starting to build up uh, across the Northeast, and you can see that vein of heat stress uh, that we're experiencing around the New York metropolitan area down into Maryland. Soil temperatures are warming, but again, you know, what's fascinating to me is that they're warmest out here to the west, creeping into the 70s uh, at the two inch depth. So you're, you're going to see a lot of weed germination, a lot of crabgrass germination throughout this region. It's going to start coming on fast, as is the growth of the turf. So let's talk about that as we I set Cal up for our conversation today. We've used this, uh, we stopped using this chart oh, four or five weeks ago, Carl, because we weren't going anywhere. Five weeks in a row, it didn't seem like we could get out of or above average temperatures above 50. And now throughout much of the Northeast, we're regularly, we just went through about a week of experiencing uh, temperatures in that peak range of photosynthetic activity for our cool season grasses, right? For our cool season grasses. Now where Cal has a part of his uh, state in the transition zone, so he's gonna be interested in warm season grasses and he has to sort of pay attention to those as well. But for us up here, there really isn't any impedance to top growth and growth of the plant and top growth in particular. So you often see, and many of our Cordell publications have this bimodal growth habit where you get a significant growth surge in the spring, uh, a decline in the summer months when irrigation and watering and heat 
Obviously, the growth potential is going to go down as the temperatures go well above average in the 70s. Uh, and then there's this resurgence of growth again, right? This resurgence of growth again that we say uh, occurs in the fall. So we call this bimodal, right? One, two, right? And we see this decline uh, in, in the summer months, usually from heat and drought. All right. So this is a very typical picture that we see from the landscape that I took just wandering around. Um, and, and you can see that uh, leaving clippings on the lawn is pretty common. Now, there's a lot of conversations to have at this time of year, uh, but how we mow is a big part of it. Now, there is an old piece of work from the 50s that has indicated cool season grasses can produce up to about 75% of all their top growth in the first six weeks of the season. Now, this was perfect fodder for good scientists like Cal and his colleague, Aaron, Aaron Patton. And I, I don't know Quincy, but I'm assuming uh, is a member of the team or was a member of the team there at Purdue. They did this great work that they published back in 2016, looking at uh, different grasses, mowing practices that reduce uh, mowing requirements. Now, before we sort of get into this wonderful study, right, we're setting the stage. Now, everybody's mowing. It's hard to follow the one-third rule. But if you are able to, you can cut your mowing needs, at least by the, the, um, the, the work they did in this study, uh, for a year by 30%. Now, when we talk about the grasses that Cal was looking at in this trial, right? There are two grasses that you'll find, uh, many grasses you'll find growing in, in his region of the country. But for the study, it was tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, characterized by low, slow, moderate, and fast growth rates. And I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Uh, a lot of these experimental uh, name and now the uh, cultivar name sold. And of course, you might notice uh, some of these varieties from things you normally see. So, so Cal, uh, much like a lot of turfgrass researchers over the last decade, spent a lot of time collecting clippings. Uh, and demonstrated uh, across the species that as we've expected, uh, we get uh, quite a bit more clipping production or significantly more clipping uh, dry matter yield in the spring than in the summer than in the fall. And then by species, again, uh, I was a little surprised by this, Cal, and this is where I'll probably bring you in now, have, have you talk to us about this a little bit. Let me go back to where I was. Sorry about that. I want to go back to that. Uh, no, that's not where I want to be. Be here. I want to be here. Can you see that? Not yet. Still, still, uh, just your, just your just screen. My face? There. Yeah, just your face. Just my. Oh, I got to share. Sorry, sorry. Botch that up. There we go. Here we go, Kim. So, this doesn't look like bimodal growth to me, pal. Unless, <laughs> unless we're talking about summer being a mode. You want to talk a little bit about what you saw here and, and the big differences between spring, summer, and autumn between, well, especially in spring. And, and the reason I'm interested in this had to do a little bit with our conversation yesterday with Brad Park about uh, Kentucky bluegrass types. Some grow better in the spring, some better in the summer. Um, you want to talk a little bit about this tall fescue Kentucky bluegrass difference that you observed here? So, so yeah, and you know, first and foremost, I probably need to give some, uh, you know, acknowledgement to Quincy. You know, Quincy's the was the master's student at the time, and he's currently a PhD student here with Dr. Patton. Uh, but you know, I think you know the genesis for that particular study was Aaron had attended, I believe, the ETS meeting, you know, in the early um, in the early 2010s, and was looking at these different. Uh, you know, we we're finally at a point that we were we're starting to get some separation between. Uh, you know, slow, medium, and fast-growing tall fescues. You know, we we bred tall fescues to that point. We'd always had uh, up to that point. You know, all those categories of Kentucky bluegrasses. And um, you know, I, I I suppose the fine print with this particular um, uh, with this particular graph is this is irrigated turf. Okay, mm. and I, I think that that plays Frank that plays a lot into that bimodal growth curve that we see because you know if the plant is under stress. Um, you know, we're definitely going to get that dip in the summer months. So this, this was irrigated turf for, for obvious reasons that, you know, we're trying to parse out the, the mowing requirements 
and you know we're we're all op operating underneath this uh, umbrella of sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at you know what can we do to reduce mowing, irrigation, fertilizer, pesticides, all those other kinds of things. But in order to do a mowing study appropriately, the plant act actually needs to be actively growing, correct? Uh, so, well, of course, you don't want any limitations to growth. That's for sure. Right, and because because that would throw off the data, and you know reviewers like you and me, we'd be all like, you know, so, so let me, well, let me put you on the spot. Let, well, let's speculate for a second here. Nobody's watching. No one's going to listen. Let's speculate. Uh, under drier conditions, what would you expect here? Let's say you irrigated uh, at a deficit. And I know you've played around with this as well. If you irrigated at a deficit, does this graph change? I would agree with you. I, I would think it would agree and it, it would change. And I, I would say that the edge would probably be given to the tall fescue in that particular situation because the tall fescue is probably going to continue to chug down the tracks a little bit longer than the Kentucky bluegrasses, right? Right. I think the other thing to look into, if you do look into that article a little bit more closely, you know, there was one that really slow growing Kentucky bluegrass in there, Prosperity. Yes. That thing is crazy slow. I mean, we talk about watching paint dry in terms of Kentucky bluegrass, mm -hmm. you know, covering in that first year. But that particular cultivar, if you look at the data for the two different years, really, really big differences, and it wasn't until year two. But to your point, we still look at this and we see definitely with the with the with the tall fescue, I, I could buy into you said 70 75% of all top growth occurs in the first six weeks. Uh, that's that probably is fairly consistent with the tall fescue, but we really don't see that bump in the autumn months, do we? We don't see sort of that peak in the spring kind of goes down and then we don't see that bump in the uh in in the fall months right but, and yeah. so and so as that translates to mowing right as that translates to number of mowing events again uh, important to know it was irrigated uh important to know they you know there are different varieties of uh of of grasses we're dealing with but the fascinating thing was i thought the fastest kentucky bluegrass was still much slower uh, than the uh, than the um, the slowest tall fescue in dry matter yield. That was a graph I didn't put in here, but this is the number of mowings, Cal. This this is from March till November, and uh, you know you're mowing what thirty something times a year now. How many times do you mow? Looks like thirty. Yeah, it's about it's about thirty. You know, our 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 growing environment is probably close to what you get, and you know when. People, I, I do bring that up quite a bit to people is how many times do you think you really mow? I don't think people pay attention to that. Not at all. Uh, and it's usually 25 to 30 for our growing region, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I would say it depends. You get to the city and Long Island, it can be 32, 35. You get up here, it's usually 28 to 32, something like that. But either way, you can see uh, what I thought was interesting is that even with some of the slow and the moderates, the the mowing frequency uh, is every two weeks, even yeah. in the spring. Yeah, following the one third rule, and that's the to me, that's what I'm trying to get across here. That yep. there are these differences, there are these changes between grasses, but fundamentally, the one third rule does it seem to suppress growth, Kale? Ooh, that, 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 that's a good question. And, you know, I, 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 I look at that one third rule for lots of um, pieces and, and one would be, you know, do I need to mow or don't I need to mow? Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, most of us are oftentimes thinking about uh, plant health because, you know, I, I think that the whole recommendation, you know, if you go back into the literature on, on the one third rule was don't compromise the root system. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so that's a piece of it. But I think more importantly, from the consumer side, they're thinking um, aesthetics, okay? Right. And if you're thinking of aesthetics, because you don't want that picture you showed with all those clippings on the surface, because supposedly those clippings contribute to thatch, right? And we know that's not true. Right. Uh, but it, it looks unsightly if you care about your if you care about your turf. Uh, and so that's where I think some of that one third rule kind of comes into play. Uh, but but Quincy did a lot of work on this because there's there's a couple different mowing programs. The weekly program he was actually uh, doing the one third rule, uh, and it was it was it was constantly evaluating those turf plots. 
Yeah, and, and, I, and you know, my sense was that anytime you're violating the one-third rule, you are getting that big drop in root growth. And again, we are starting to see, we, heard, we have heard from golf course superintendents as well, that that dramatic drop in growth has now been associated with some root pathogens. They, they were taller. They were using more growth regulators. Uh, they added some stress by, and violated the one-third rule a little bit. And the next thing you know, uh, they've got root problems. So these things uh, are intimately linked. Now, you also did some, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, this was this, a fascinating. This was a really good study. Wow, yeah, my goodness gracious. Um, yeah, I, I, we, I really, just, we just don't simple. see a lot of, we don't see a lot of academics taking on cost. Right. And, and, and again, I got to give some, you know, acknowledgement and respect to my, my entomology colleague here, Dr. Richmond. I mean, he's, he's really, in addition to being a great entomologist, he's, he's just a good ecologist in terms of what he, you know, thinks about. And, you know, this study here with Victoria, who was a master's student at the time, but she did a really, it was elegantly simple, basically four different programs, the do nothing program, uh, uh, you know, organic products that were available at the time, uh, a consumer program for, you know, uh, the, the Scots, basically four bagger type of program, mm -hmm. and then an integrated pest management program where you did some scouting to look for different potential pests and, and putting some thresholds in place um, to uh, decide whether or not to treat or not. And so you can kind of see here the four different programs. So the top left, that's the IPM program with the letter A, uh, the B, the consumer program, the, the Scott's you know, consumer program uh, that you can get at the big box centers, uh, the natural organic program, which had things like corn gluten and uh, you know, uh, some of the other kinds of things that would be out there. And basically the do nothing program, or as some people like to refer to it as the freedom lawn, right? You know, you're, you're free from doing anything. And, and we've talked about that over the years. Except but, mowing, except mowing. Well, you still need it. well, some of those freedom lawns, they, they, they mow in frequently as well. It's, it's a mess. But in this but, study, you mowed frequently. They did. Yeah, these were regularly mowed um, at, at, I believe, three inches, you know, a cool season lawn mixture. And uh, you can kind of see what's happening here. But that, that, that economic piece, uh, and that was probably the, the real take-home message from this paper. And this, this probably hasn't gotten as much traction as it, as it, as it could out there. Uh, but this idea that, you know, a professional lawn care company could, instead of taking that prophylactic approach to indiscriminately applying pesticides, whether they're needed or not, you know, pre-emergence herbicides, insecticides, all those other kinds of things, but simply by scouting, uh, there actually was a potential return on investment and a potential reduction in some of the products that might be needed to be applied to the lawns. And so, well, there certainly is a gap here where mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to be traditional and go with Scott's, uh, I could charge 2500 uh, if I'm in the lawn care business and the the 1900 cal, uh, this included labor as well, right? That that was the big cost. Yeah, if you go into that article and and she did a real nice job trying to tease out, you know, what those costs would be. But the product costs went down, but labor costs for a trained, um, you know, assistant technician or something, uh, you know, that can be expensive. Labor is expensive. We know that. And 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 I guess the the thing that was interesting to me was that. You know, how does this work when you're deploying people out into a, into a, a, a region? You know, visiting more than is there going to be, I don't recall exactly did they take transport costs and things like that because you have to visit more. Now, this is a consumer, not a professional. So, so this would be, uh, you know, the, the idea was to, to look at the idea of having somebody, a technician coming to your lawn. So if you you know, employed some sort of like Frank's Lawn Care Company that has, mm -hmm. you know, 18 people working for him, mm -hmm. driving around in their Priuses, you know, kind of yeah, being of course, of course, conservation minded, conservation minded, but checking on a property and deciding, okay, hey, we've got one area that does need treated here, you know, take, taking into account micro environments, all those other kinds of things, or hey, there's just one patch of yellow nuts edge here, we don't need to treat the entire lawn. Uh, it was it was those kinds of things. And, and ultimately, what I thought was interesting is clover came on like crazy in these, in these plots. Uh, what, what are you, this has been a constant theme forced upon the industry and now embraced by the industry and now beginning to be studied by scientists. What the heck is it with clover? Have we been sort of keeping this plant at bay and now 
any kind of variation to what we do, and it seems to be a predominant species in northern lawns. You know, it, it's interesting how competitive that particular plant is, right? And, uh, you know, we, I had a grad student uh, a couple years ago, we were looking at some of those micro clovers as a potential for self-feeding lawn. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Dr. Munshaw was doing some work down at the University of Kentucky in the mid uh, 2010s also with some of those micro clovers. And it was interesting in the sense that sometimes when you tried to keep it, it wouldn't stay around. But in situations like this, it just naturally invaded, invaded into the plots, right? And uh, it is an indicator weed for, you know, under fertilized turf. So that could be part of it as well. But um, I, we've got a lot blooming right here in West Lafayette today. Well, and I would be remiss if I didn't use some of this work to launch into uh, crabgrass discussion as well, Cal. I know back in your previous life with Dernoden, you played around with crabgrass. You don't do any lawn work anywhere in your neck of the woods. You're under heavy crabgrass, goosegrass pressure out there. You, can you live without, I don't see crabgrass in these plots. And I'm wondering, did corn gluten meal work? Is it something that we're maintaining density in these plots that we're able to keep the crabgrass at bay? Because I would have thought I'd have seen a bigger crabgrass issue uh, in, this, in this particular trial. Can you comment? Yeah, and and so you know one of one of the big differences, and I grew up in the Mid Atlantic, so I you know I know I know heat and humidity, and uh, crabgrass in the Mid Atlantic is very very different than it is here in the Midwest. I mean we oh. have it, but it's not like it is down in the Ohio River Valley or in, in the in the Mid Atlantic. You know these plots at, at three inches, that that was enough to kind of keep it out, uh, but we do not have the pressure at our at our turf facility like we did at the University of Maryland or even at Virginia Tech. It was. Um, uh, much, much worse out there. But that three inch mowing height, uh, plus, you know, products like the Scott's consumer products or the corn gluten uh, could sufficiently keep out the crabgrass in those plots. So what about mowing height? Let's bring it all back to the mowing height and weeds. I know you probably played around with their node and when you were there, he was messing around with mowing heights and crabgrass. I know you've played around with mowing heights and nutrition over the years. What about mowing heights and crabgrass uh, we control three inches is the height you like for lawns, isn't it? I, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm closer to three, maybe even three and a half inches in my own lawn. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that's a little bit of a personal preference. I have one individual in my household, not to be named, uh, <laughs> but she, she actually says the lawn is too high for her. Um, I, I think you can figure out who that is, but yes. uh, I, I, I have like that it. same person. I think she might be the same person. It could be, it could be in this household. We have we have three female dogs and I have a, a daughter and a wife. So you know there's there's five potential females it could be. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, I do like to keep my lawn higher for that reason of trying to you know keep some of the crabgrass out. And as you're mowing it, listen, if you're keeping it at two inches, that means you've got to mow it when it gets to three. At exactly. this time of year, it's a grass. You, you want to give me a guess? You want to give me a guess at how quick I got to mow that? It's probably every four days. To keep it where it needs to be and and then every four days i'm opening up the canopy again yep and giving chance for light to penetrate and that is part of the issue of why mowing height keeps uh weeds at bay is not just that it grows it's that it keeps the canopy shaded for a while and i've started to put some things together in my little you know gray cells up north here in my head in autonomous mowing, we're constantly clipping a cow. We're constantly keeping the canopy open. My pigs, they find an area, they constantly chew it, they constantly wear it down, and I see more weeds there. I don't, I think it's allowing the grass to grow longer that extends the time you have to open up the canopy is as much as the control as the height itself. Thoughts? I, I, you know, the idea of these autonomous mowers, I think, could be a real big game changer if they can get those figured out, because I think it's going to allow us to keep a more consistent canopy, and it might even reduce some of the stress. If we're nipping off the, li the leaf tips, instead of taking a whole one-third chunk, if we're just nipping off those leaf tips, you know, every couple, three days, that might be helpful as well. Um, but again, mow it, mow it high and let them lie, right? And mow it high and let them lie. And that's a place to take questions. Carl, do we get any questions? 
Yeah, and, and we you guys were touching on it earlier about root growth. Dan Scheid's asking about um, that, you know, that typical graph you see in a textbook. It's the bimodal, and it's got the top growth and the bottom growth. Um, and he's kind of asking, you know, it, have we proven, you know, we measure all these clippings now, we have a better idea now of top growth. What do we know about bottom growth in relation to that? Does it show the same patterns as top growth? Have we done anything there? And uh, any, any comments on that? Well, that's a really good question that I'd expect my pal Dan Scheid to ask. And so let me go back to the chart uh, that we typically use, right? I mean, here's the problem. Not enough people study roots, and I know why. I tried it twice, and I said, I'm done with this. And I don't know if, Cal, you feel differently about it, but I'd say, first off, we don't know a lot about roots because they're, they're not as easy to study as the top parts. What you see here is a depiction of our best thinking of how, and even some of the latest research that we see with uh, Bingru's done at Rutgers, where there are some grasses that can root under warmer soil temperatures, but typically root growth is most active when it's cool. There's been some work that's been done looking at, uh, you know, violating the one third rule. And a lot of it was in pasture work years ago uh, with the way they let them graze and they'd see a, a stunting of root growth. But I'll just set the stage, Cal. I'm going to ask you, do you know the answer to Dan's question about what do we I, know I, about root growth? I don't know the answer, and I think it is so complicated, quite honestly, because you have things, you know, everything's driven by temperature, right? I mean, so you've got, you know, the soil temperature piece of that, but then you have this whole thing of different soil environments and different oxygen status of the soil. Um, you know, back to, you know, one of my mentors, you know, Pete Gernoden, and he had a, a postdoc working with him, Dr. Fu. Uh, Dr. Fu did a whole bunch of uh, root scans looking at summer cultivation, and that's an, that's an interesting paper to kind of pull out someday and, uh, you know, looking at you know, different ages of the plant and that, that summer cultivation and whether summer cultivation had some effects, but uh, <coughs> those root scans were painful, and uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Fu spent a lot of time trying to pull all that information out of there, but like you said, um, if, if I don't have to measure roots, I tend to stay away from them. That's exactly right. And, and I do think this, yeah, and I'm, here's what I would say about rooting. I would say, number one, if you got a soil that, it, that a plant will root deep into, that's not restricted by compaction, has plenty of nutrition, water's moving down through, and all those things are good, I'm not entirely sure how some you know, moderation of the one third rule is going to dramatically impact something like that. I think if you did it constantly, it would probably lead to some reduction. It would probably lead to a balancing effect. But I, I, I'm with Cal. I, I actually think uh, soil things are, are much bigger than mowing things. But I do think there is this dramatic shock. Pam Sherratt said it to us in the sports turf thing a couple of weeks ago. Mowing is stress. Mowing is stress. And it appears that following the one third rule seems to be that sweet spot where we know top growth is moderate. I guess we can assume root growth, if it's unimpeded, is going to be moderate as well. All right, Carl, what's next? Hey, can I, uh, can yeah. I do, a, can I do a, a quick shameless plug? Can I share absolutely here? Yes. How, how does that? Uh... Oh, you want to share your screen? Yeah. Great. Carl, can you give it to him? Oh, yeah. I'll give it to you real quick. Um... I'll make you a co-host. All right. There you go. Should update there. there. Is it there? Yeah, yeah. If you go on the bottom share screen, hopefully uh should allow you to share now. All right. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So here's our here's oh, our shameless plug. Beautiful. So we have uh, we launched this app um, about two years ago. There's actually a whole suite here. It's uh, Purdue Turf Doctor, Tree Doctor, Flower Doctor, all these other kinds of things. If you just type in Purdue, you know, whatever doctors, you can download these things for a buck ninety-nine. They're really neat in the sense that they are resident on your mobile device. And so once you pay the dollar ninety-nine, whether you have mobile phone access or not, you can scroll through pictures of all the different, you know, insects, disease, weed pests, you know, all those other kinds of things in, in your lawn. So Wanted to kind of just put that out there for people. Less than a cup of Starbucks coffee, you know. <laughs> Proceeds benefit the Purdue Turf Program. So, uh, you know, great. this thing, we'll, we'll get this 
big spike in uh, people downloading this thing, that's, right? That's correct. And what is that little chart there up in the right, Kale? Chart on the right. Oh, uh, in that slide that has the bluegrass with irrigation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's get to that. that. Yeah, so I want to get to that. So sorry about that. No, no worries. That's a cool thing. Yeah, picture. so this, this I also wanted to highlight some work that we'll have coming out here. This was one of my master's students, uh, Jada Powell. But she spent two years basically irrigating, uh, similar to Quincy's study, but we had uh, drought susceptible and drought tolerant tall fescues and Kentucky bluegrasses. And she used a, a green color threshold, 70% green. She would water the plots twice a week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and basically what we had here is the green lines are the tall fescue, blue lines being Kentucky bluegrass, and uh, that red line, that linear red line being a set it and forget it Monday, Wednesday, Friday program. But uh, just showing the difference between tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass uh, irrigation requirements. Again, we continue to try, try and push more and more tall fescues for a lot of these properties uh, for less fertility uh, and also less water use. But um, just wanted to kind of share some of that work. Uh, that, you know, that is such cool work because the first thing I think is, well, look, if you just pay attention a little <coughs> bit, how much water you save. Yep. Right. Just with a bluegrass. Right. right. Uh, look at just paying attention saves you some water. And then a little bit more if you've got some grasses, uh, maybe more if you put a soil moisture meter, uh, maybe more if you tolerate a little more browning tissue to 50 percent, maybe. And before you know it, you realize in some of our climates, we need just supplemental, maybe one deep a week if we've got a halfway decent soil. This is such important work, Kyle. You're gonna, you're gonna talk, Caleb. But you're gonna talk about this at the agronomy meetings, the crop meetings in the fall. Yeah, we've had, we've. She's had the poster, and uh, I think last year did an oral presentation. So this, this should be getting out into our literature sometime this year, is our hope. Um, and and again, I think if if we had some sort of a uh, effort across the United States, like the graph you showed earlier, you know, there's a lot of water loss and uh, potential water needs up your way, but you know, it, it's right plant, right place, right. And yeah. so if we're looking for water conservation, uh, we've got some grasses that you know, definitely don't need to be watered quite as much. I think what's really interesting here is, look, it's almost 30 days until the tall fescue actually hit that, that threshold of 70% green that those plants needed to be watered. So this was a rain out shelter yeah. study, but yeah. again, we've got some good you, work and happening. You, and when you think about the actual number of days in the last five years, the actual number of times we've gone more than 30 days without rainfall, I can't even think you'd find one in the Northeast. Certainly the last two years, you haven't found one. Yeah. Maybe in the last five, it's barely. So we've said a lot to people, maybe you don't need to irrigate as much, but Cal, there's also an industry that, you know, needs the grass to keep growing and, and consumers sure. want a particular lawn and, and that's the tra tra traditional way of doing it. And this is the progressive way of doing it. But, but I think that conventional schedule, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, we, we got to figure that one out, Frank. Yeah. I think, We're the it, I think the set it and forget it is exactly the mentality we have there. All right, Carl, we're at the right. witching hour. How much time? Any questions? Uh, I, th I think we're uh, we're all set. We did have a question, and maybe we're, we're not going to get out of this webinar series without asking it. But Michael's asking about dogs and urine. Um, any any turf species that are uh, immune to the, the dog spots, the urine burnout spots. Uh, he's asking about tall fescue specifically. But have um, you been playing around with this, Kale? Um, years ago, we did a few things. I, I think our colleague up at North Dakota, uh, Dai Ying, might have done a, a couple studies looking at some of these things. But um, I personally, just observationally, anecdotally. With three dogs. I got three dogs, uh, three female dogs. Three female. Okay, three big female dogs. They don't pee on a tree, they squat and pee. Correct. And my, my anecdotal observations is there's a summer stress piece of this too. And so this time of year, we generally don't see, the, I don't see the dog spots. When we get to July and the soil temperatures are warmer, the plants potentially under stress, I, you know, we really haven't changed the dog's diet. Maybe they're drinking slightly less or more, I don't know. Uh, but that's the time of the year that I usually see the injury. So, so. you think it's seasonal as much as the, the mm -hmm. burn from the urea as well? Well, and people talk about, you know, ammonia volatilizing, you know, a variety of different things, but, uh, there, there's no easy answer there. There's no easy answer. Let's be honest. Yeah, no. 
No, well, the easy answer is that you might be better. Yeah. Uh, well, for the cool season, warm season, the warm season grasses will be a little bit better, won't they? I, I would think so. I would think so. But we still need to find somebody to fund that work, right? Right. So. All right. We're good on questions, Carl. Cal, we're good? I'm good. Great to see you. Thanks for taking the nice time. Appreciate it. Carl, Frank. Yeah. Take Thanks, care Dad. Of really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, Carl, we'll, see you, we'll see you in the fall when the grass stops growing. Right. Yeah, we'll get back to these at some point. We'll see. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Al. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.